welcome everybody to our July council meeting. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Renee McLennan, I'm the Mayor of the Town of Bassadine. Mr Bridges, would you mind sitting down please? Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge that the town of Bassendine is founded on the land of the Wajak Noongar people, always was and always will be. So just a few announcements tonight. Hopefully everybody has already signed in but also scanned in their safe WA app. So if you haven't done that, can you make sure you do that before you leave this evening? Um, also, we need to make everybody aware that, as usual, tonight's meeting is uh, live streamed and recorded, so it's made available publicly on the town's website. So just so that people are aware that um, whatever they say in tonight's meeting is made available to members of the community and that there's no protection offered for anything that people may choose to say as part of this recording. Um, if you were here last week, which many of you were, you would have also heard me mention um, that August will be a month dedicated to consultation on the future of our town centre. Um, as many of you be aware, there's already been preliminary engagement with many of the stakeholders um, and community that are directly involved with our town centre. Um, and that feedback has been used to formulate a draft plan. Um, but before council considers any plan for our town centre, we're seeking feedback from the broader community. So um, the month of August will involve several open days, a survey, um, uh, static displays at the shopping centre, the library and various locations around the town. So we encourage everybody to get involved um, and provide your feedback on the future of our town centre. Um, and as I mentioned last week, yeah. as I mentioned last week, uh, there's a lot of interest in a couple of the items on tonight's agenda. So thank you for your interest in what is happening in our town. Once again, um, I'm very conscious that there's a lot of emotion around some of these topics. Um, so I just want to remind people that it's really important that when we engage together this evening that there's a level of respect and courtesy that is shown to one another. Um, as people may be aware, under the town's meeting procedures local law, um, anybody who's in attendance is required to remain quiet and not disrupt the meeting. And if um, there's an instruction given by the presiding member, which is myself this evening, um, then you're required to follow that instruction. So look forward to... Um, having some good debate this evening. Um, there are differences of opinion, but I know that as a community, um, respecting one another's differences and coming together is the, um, of ultimate importance. So, um, moving on then to item three, which is attendances, apologies and applications for leave. Um, Councilman William, I believe you're on leave as of tomorrow, is that correct? Yes, sir, coming back in the state on the 6th of August. 6th of August. Is there anybody else? Okay, do we have a mover for that leave of absence for Councillor William? Councillor Wilson moved, seconded Councillor Hamilton. Is there anybody against? So that is carried. Uh, item four is declarations of interest. Um, as has always been the case on item 12.2, which is Surrey Street, um, I'm declaring an impartiality interest due to my um, remote family connection with a board member from the Museum of Perth, which is the preferred respondent to the EOI process. Are there any other declarations of interest from councillors? Okay, so moving on to presentations and deputations, which we have not received any. Um, item six is statements by members of the public. So as most of you would be aware, this is the opportunity to make a statement on any of the items on tonight's agenda. So we have 15 minutes dedicated for statements. If you have something that you would like to um, make comment on on tonight's agenda, I will welcome people to raise their hand and I'll call you to the microphone where you can make your statement. I would ask that you identify which item number you are speaking to and your name and address. We have had oh, Mr. Kulikoy is here. Seeing as you have submitted yours, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Is that uh, microphone working for me? Uh, we can hear you, thank you. Okay, excellent. Uh, by all accounts, the town is currently facing budgetary challenges and council needs to prioritise between many worthy projects. Uh, the restoration of the Pensioner Guard College is one of those competing priorities. Uh, the rest, uh, however, not all uh, projects have to occur at once. Uh, and the town is in the privileged position of owning the Pensioner Guard College. Uh, so it has minimal outgoings and the town doesn't have to pay rent or rates. If, as has been reported, the Pensioner Guard College is structurally sound, then no action needs to be taken immediately. The project can be deferred whilst funds are accumulated each year into a reserve fund for the purpose of restoring the Pensioner Guard College and the residents. Again, whilst no purpose has been currently identified for the residents, uh, 
it is beneficial to the community to have uh, additional flexible civic spaces that can be uh, deployed as and when the need arises in the future. Uh, let's not sell this property only to have to buy another one in the future. Uh, is, interestingly, the local government is permitted to invest in real estate. Uh, surprisingly, that doesn't even need to be within the local government's district. Uh, it would provide historical value and financial return for the town to retain both the pension of Gower Cottage and the residents until the budget allows them to be restored. Uh, we shouldn't be lulled into taking the easy path and being part of the afterpay generation seeking instant gratification. When you want something, you save for it, and then you get it once you've saved enough. Uh, the expression of interest pro process did not yield results consistent with the above, with no party wanting to entertain a long-term lease. Whilst the preferred tenderer, who has done quite a bit of work on this, ought to be given the first right to negotiate a long-term lease, if that process falls over, uh, then it is suggested that a new expression of interest process, as has been mentioned as a possibility by uh, the director, uh, ought to be commenced. Uh, please don't let the, current, the town's current financial position uh, affect this decision. Don't, don't let that shape what's happening here. Uh, once this property is sold, it's sold. It can't be reversed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next speaker. Uh, no, we're still on statements. If there's no okay. further statements, though, we can move on to questions. Is there anybody else that would like to make a statement? <coughs> Mr Brown? Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, uh, I did write uh, to uh, the Council when we went through the expressions of interest process to express a number of questions. Because, you see, if you are to make an informed comment on a proposal, you need to have the detail. And with due respect to the council, the detail was not provided. And that's why my letter, which could be considered as one of the three that didn't take a position for or against, wanted the detail. It is obligatory. It is obligatory on the council to provide that detail. It's obligatory and it was not provided. For example, on the previous council agenda and the discussion, it was talked about an agreement with the Museum of Perth. The Museum of Perth is not a registered organisation. It's not an incorporated body. This agenda talks about a proposal with the Perth Historical Society, which is a registered body. So that one question has been answered by virtue of this. But there's a whole range of other questions. And one of the questions goes to financial viability. Now in any sale, in any sale, the normal question is, does the party that wishes to purchase have the financial capacity to purchase. It's as simple as that. And if they have the capacity, they buy. If they don't have the capacity, they don't. <coughs> this is not that arrangement. This arrangement is an arrangement by which the council proposes to enter into an agreement based on the capacity of the other party to deliver. That is, you enter into this arrangement you believe that the other party can deliver on this arrangement. If you do not believe they can deliver on this arrangement, you should not enter into it. I've had a look Thank you, now. Mr. Brown. That's your two minutes, so I'm going to have to ask you to stop there. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I possibly ask our officers, there are a couple of points that Mr. Brown made that I would like to get some clarification on, if you wouldn't mind. So one was his comment just then about um, the Museum of Perth not being incorporated for uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the respondent was, in fact, uh, whilst it was a museum in Perth, it was the Perth History Association Incorporated trading as a museum. Great. Thank you very much. And the other question was around financial viability, which is, of course, a, a valid question. I um, understand that the Museum of Perth's financials have been provided to councillors for the last 
um, for the recent years, um, acknowledging that the most recent financial year statements haven't yet been audited. Um, was that something that's available to the general public or just council at this stage? Um, I understand he's approving now to release that to the public, but that was only just received. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes, Mr. Carter. Uh, Bevan Carter, 8 Highland Street, Bassendean. I believe the financial statements of the organisation have not been published, and I believe that was what Mr. Clive Brown was going to finish with. So what I just clarified was that they've been provided to councillors, and there's they been... haven't hold on. been published. Hold on. They haven't been published on the website, are you saying, for the organisation or on our agenda for community members? No, they haven't been published as they so, are required so this is, by So law. this is what I'm saying. So they are, the Museum of Perth will make them available to our community so that people can be satisfied that the organisation has the financial viability to deliver on their proposal. So we can't see those? No, I just said that they would be made available to you. After. Okay, we're just in statements at the moment. So is there anybody else who'd like to make a statement on any of the items? Okay, in that case, we'll move on to item seven, which is questions from members of the public. Just, no, one, Ian, sorry. Mr. Wilson, are we going back to statements? Yes. Okay. Yes. So here, it says here in your notes here, the Museum of Perth advised that it's got $30,000 in its bank account. It's saying that they'll commit $50,000 a year over four years. We had a grant for 375,000. True or false? It's not question time, Mr. Wellstead, it's statements. Okay. So I'm saying you had the money and refused it. This is something there that's, and I don't believe that you have got a, um, a full understanding of the community in regards to this. I understand that we will have our say in October, which, you know, is election time. Um, there's a lot of resentment about what's happening here. I don't believe that these people will be able to fulfill this. An absolute caveat is something there that I wouldn't have faith in. Because an absolute caveat means that no further transaction can take place while the caveat's on there. So when they run, in, run out of funds, you could easily take that caveat off. Do what they like very disappointing in this council that we've come to this part where we're divided. <coughs> very divided. And um, I think that if we knew that the process was taking place, I was under the understanding and the total belief in this council that it would be given to the historical society. If I don't know it was going like this, funds would have been made available, trust me. It's sad what you're doing, and I won't use any more words than that, but it is sad. And as councillors, you'll need to look at the rate payers come election time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wellstead. Okay, is there any more statements before we move on to questions? Okay, in that case, is there anybody who would like to make, to ask a question? Mrs. Carter? Oh, yes. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. Ross McDonald from uh, Candy Street, Boston Bay. Mr. McDonald, would you mind speaking up just a little, please? I'll try and speak into the mic. Thank you. I've got a concern with the caveat that uh, it's supposed to protect all the council's interest in this land and prevent all sorts of things. As a retired lawyer and an old titles office man from way back, the caveat is something you put on a title, there are lots of ways to get rid of a caveat, and it doesn't force people to do anything, it stops them from doing anything. So to give the property away and hope that somebody will do the renovations and all the other obligations under the agreement isn't gonna do you any good with a caveat. It's not gonna be any protection. The only protection is you keep the fee simple yourself and make it a subject to a contract to sale or lease and say so when you've performed all your obligations then you can take the title 
Ms. McDonald, do you have a question at the moment? Yeah, my question is, um, can we send your proposed contract to an appropriate lawyer at the, the, mem uh, the uh, Museum of Perth ex Expense for advice before you continue negotiating the contract any further? I think any reputable lawyer is going to tell you have a conditional contract and transfer at the end if it all happens and protecting by COVID is not going to get you anywhere. It, it, there's no security at all for the organisation. And maybe I can ask one of our staff to comment on your question because that would certainly so be so <coughs> Thank you. Um, there have been some discussions with um, lawyers as part of this process and certainly as part of finalising negotiations we would engage a lawyer to undertake the appropriate paperwork to ensure that the town's interests are protected. The problem is, from the advice we've been given so far, <coughs> the contract or the negotiations with the Museum of Perth are in flux. flux. They're underway and you're doing it without legal advice and you really need to know your rights first before you sit down with the Museum of Perth and say, this is what we want. You've promised all these things in your expression of interest. We want to convert them to enforceable obligations. And to do that, you'll need legal advice on how to do it. So we'll take that as a comment, Mr. McDonald, but our CEO just confirmed that there has already been discussions with lawyers and that will be ongoing if council does support um, the Museum of Perth's proposal this evening. Do you have another question? Yeah, the question is, will you delay any decision? until you get that advice, do the <coughs> negotiations, let people know what the new situation is and then come back and make a decision. Okay, so that's a question for Council to consider when this item comes up, so thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Mark Johnston from Ida Street in Bassendine. My question to all of you is can anyone explain how the benefit to the Council, sorry, to the ratepayers and the residents, along with the Council, this sale is beneficial. So you ask for a community benefit and a financial benefit and or a financial benefit. For a dollar, where's the benefit in that financially? Where's the community benefit when three organisations such as the Historical Society, the Arts Council and Firebird will be gone? Where is the benefit to the community and the ratepayers? So just on your comment there, I think some of your statements are a bit misleading from... Um, oh, okay, we talk about misleading. Excuse me. Sorry. Well, excuse me. Okay. With the Museum of Perth's um, EOI, there's been obvious inclusion of provision for the Arts um, Group and the Bassendine Historical Society, so the invitation has remained open. And I understand that they are very keen to include those groups in the use of the building. So to say that they are gone is, is misleading. Well, I don't think so. Like the I'm not here to argue with you. You asked a question and I answered it. If you've got another question, you're welcome to ask it. Okay, how is the council going to address the ambiguity of the Museum of Perth being the preferred tenure when you, they can't hold land? We've already heard that that's the case and that it should be the Perth History Association. Why are the council now not considering to delay the, the, the vote tonight to go back, start the process again, stating the correct entity instead of being almost deceitful in saying it's the museum. Of okay, Perth. so I'm not going to let you. Um, make, no, I'm not going to let you make comments that it's about. The Perth museum and not I'm the not museum going of to Perth. let you make comments about the organisation being deceitful. They trade. No, I'm talking about Excuse the me, you do not have the right to speak over me in this room. The but museum. You're being of, excuse me, if you interrupt again, I will ask you to leave. Mr. Grogan, you as well. He hasn't said anything. No. He is laughing in the room. That is against the meeting procedures, local law. You're required oh, to be respectful. I didn't hear him laughing. Excuse me. If this continues, I'm going to adjourn the meeting for 10 minutes. Mm. Okay. <coughs> can you please? Question, no. Can you please return to your seat? If there are other questions that people would like to ask, yes, Mrs. Carter. Jenny Carter, Eight Highland Street, Bassendine. Um, my question is, the Museum of Perth will need access to the local history collection as the mainstay of its computer training services. 
And if the materials in the Bass and Dean local history collections are to be used, right, or whatever you call it, for the purposes of a private organisation to become the gatekeeper and expert in Bass and Dean history, then this needs to be made explicit. This might also prove to be against the intentions of hundreds of Bass and Dean people who over more than 35 years have generously given their records, their photographs, their memorabilia uh, to the library for safekeeping and research. And I don't know whether you know, but when I did the research for the history of Bass and Dean, the nucleus of the Bass and Dean local history collection is what people gave me and what I collected. Um, have councillors considered issues of copyright and intellectual property in this collection? What extra duties will be expected of the local studies librarian when they sit to service the information needs of this private organisation? Thank you for your question. Um, Mr Gibson, is that something that you're able to provide any insights into or something we need to get back to Mrs Carter? Uh, through Madam Mayor, uh, that would, depending on what council deed involves tonight, that would be a matter to consider in due course. Yes, thank you. So I'm not sure we can give you a definitive answer this evening, but definitely something to be considered. But it isn't in the, it, can I just yeah. add a, a yeah, yeah, please do. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. It isn't in the Museum of Perth's EOI, but it underpins the whole point of it. If they can't get complete access to this information, free and gratis, is, I don't know, whatever help and background this council is going to give them, it won't work properly. And I think they're, they're expecting it to be, be done that way. And I think you'll find that a lot of people who have given materials into the into this wonderful collection, it's one of the best, I just, they might wish to remove them. I'm just letting you know. Thank you for um, that. Thank you for, for letting me ask that question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, please, Mr Brown. Uh, my first question is in four parts. Um, four parts? Four parts. Is, is the council aware of the following? One, that the, um, that the Perth History Association is a registered organisation under the ACNC legislation. Yes, we are aware of that. Two, is the council aware that under the ACNC legislation it is required to carry out proper audits of its books and have those audits published within six months of the end of the financial year. Three, has the uh, Perth um, History Association carried out that according to its published website? Four, is the council aware that the latest published reports on the, on the Perth Historical Society's website uh, for 2019 and those reports show a deficit in terms of trading of $35,000 and a deficit in terms of assets of around $20,000. Okay, so in answer to your questions, um, yes we are aware. Um, Councillors have been provided with these statements, I'm not sure whether they're published on um, the Perth History Association's website. I am aware that the um, audited statements from 2019 are there. Um, whether or not the most recent audited statement is there, I would have to check, but um, otherwise you are correct. Well, two, to what extent do you believe that the council has to exercise proper due diligence in entering into an arrangement like this to be assured of itself that there is minimal risk and that there is the capacity within the organisation to which you propose to enter into this arrangement that they have the capacity to meet all the benchmarks that are required of this proposed arrangement. Well, of course, it's incumbent upon the local government to do our due diligence, and I believe the staff have been working with um, the preferred um, submitter um, and as I said to you, the documents, so the financials, have been provided to councillors and will be made available. So councillors have had the opportunity to look at those documents and to form an opinion themselves as to whether or not the organisation has the ability to deliver on the proposal. Okay. Oh, 
The only reason I ask that question, Madam Mayor, is that on your own agenda paper, your officers talk about risk. Mrs Carter. Uh, Jenny Carter, Ag Haven, Highland Street, Bassendine. Can I ask the question why 20 submissions have been refused by the Town of Bassendine? There was absolutely nothing on the website to indicate that only the ratepayers of Bassendine were permitted to make a submission on the proposal to give one Surrey Street to the Museum of Perth. The invitation was that members of the public... So can I just, just interrupt you there, because I don't think there was a refusal. The current well, agenda... Not, included them. So the current agenda's been updated to show that the 40 of the submissions, I think it was, were from within the town of Bassendine. Um, councillors have been provided with all of the submissions, including those from outside of the local government area. But you gave an indication last week that all the submissions will be published, or all of the submissions would be accessible. So and just, just sorry, can I, can I, sorry, can I sorry. Uh, were the um, were the submissions from the outside area not included? Um, I believe they were all included. No, that's no. Not. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> some of the submissions were redacted, so um, the town would be liable if it was to reproduce information that um, was defamatory. Okay. So some of the submissions have been redacted for that reason. No, I do understand that. I'm very happy to have my name put on my submission and I'd like to see it there. And I think the other organisations were very happy to be noted because they're the senior historical and heritage organisations in Perth. They took a lot of trouble to make these submissions and they're, they're, and as I, was, as I was led to believe, and I may be wrong and I'll certainly I certainly would like that confirmed, that the public, they were invited to be respond, to respond. So, if they're not included, these submissions, then my answer, my question to you, why not? And will you please include them? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I had the access to the unredacted, so I didn't look at the ones that had been redacted, so I can't answer with certainty whether they were included, but I think um, it's your Yeah, yeah. Just, to, just to clarify, some people actually did ask to be de-identified. Yes, I, sorry, can, can I just say, I do understand that. I didn't, but my name's taken off. And other people I know didn't, but their names have just been removed. These organisations didn't, but their names have been removed. Now, very well to, to, re, to take off the names that wish to be taken. I have no problem with that. But can you please identify those that wish to be the identified as uh, either in favour or against this proposal? Thank you. Thank you. And we've just had confirmation from Mr Gibson that all of the submissions were included, but take your point that some of the organisations and individuals may have wish to keep their identification on there. We do. And is that going to be updated? We can, we can arrange that. Thank you very much. Okay, are there any further questions? Yes. Yeah, just, just a very brief question. Of the 40 that were determined to have uh, emanated from Alexor's, uh, do we have the split of for and against? Um, yes, I'm sure that's recorded. Do you have that? Number okay, Mr. Gibson. Uh, sixty-one objections. Yes. Uh, through Madam Mayor, so there were sixty-one objections um, of the twenty that originated from outside the district. All were objections. Um, so of the local objections, uh, that was forty-one. So all twenty from outside uh, were against the proposal. Okay. Thank you. Right. Anything further? Yes, Mr. Bridges. Now, councillors, the 15 minutes for question time is about to expire. Would somebody like to move to extend question time? Councillor Quinton, is there a seconder? Councillor William, is there anybody against? Okay, so that is carried. Mr Bridges, we'll extend that for another five minutes for now. Thank you. Paul Bridges, 150 West Road, Bassendine. Uh, first, I'd like some clarification. My question relates to the, um, the draft town centre master plan, and I realise that that's part of the amendment to your, your minutes from the, yep. the last meeting. Uh, so, but am I able to ask a question? Um, uh, yes, and if it's something that's within the confidential documents, we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, the, um, in, in the draft uh, Town Centre Master Plan, um, there's a whole lot of background documentation that, um, that, that relates to it. Do you mean the consultation that has led up to the development of the yeah, draft the, plan? The, the stuff yep. that the <coughs> consultants have yep. put forward, you know, page by page, referring to things like heritage, public open space. Yep. So my question, I've got two questions on that. Um, one, in the public open space um, lead up document, 
uh, it fails to record, it, it talks about there being no net loss of public open space, which is fine, um, but it, it fails to identify the 341 square metre council owned park adjacent to the RSL hall. Um, so that's, that's left out, it's not listed, it's not listed in the, 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 the summary total, but it just disappears and becomes a, a six storey development site, uh, as does the, the RSL hall. So my question on that is, why is it left out? Um, and I'm sure that you won't be able to answer that straight away. The other one relates to the heritage considerations. Now, it, it refers the, the draft plan which is put forward as the preferred option reduces the size of the oval. Um, and what that, what that does is give an extra 1,550 square metres of development space for the building which will pre be presumably the, the Swan District's um, the site. Um, now, why is that? Bassendean Oval is state heritage listed. The, the size of the oval and the white picket fence around it is state heritage listed. This is ignored and your preferred plan reduces the size of the oval um, to give that 1,550 additional square metres of development space. My question is, why has that been not acknowledged by the consultants and why haven't the town staff picked it up about the bit of public open space that's not in your totals? I'll see, I'll see if Mr Gibson's able to add to that now, whether it's something you'd like to get back to Mr Bridges on. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, in terms of the RSL site at the corner of Kenny and Georgia Road, uh, whilst that's reserved as local open space under the current scheme, under the draft LDS 11, which Council considered in November last year, that is proposed to be rezoned to R100. And but it's proposed, not, it hasn't happened yet. That's correct. <coughs> yeah, so, so, so just, can we just let Mr Gibson finish first? So the master plan, one of the objectives of the master plan was to remain as consistent I'd suggest that that's <coughs> dishonest, really, in, in terms of the consultants, because that it preempts the decision. So that was council actually requested that the master plan reflected the draft um, local planning scheme, which is currently with the WAPC. So it's not the consultants being dishonest; it's council attempting to present a consistent plan to the community, but. I understand that you're concerned about some of those elements, so that's really why we need people to provide feedback on this plan. So as you know, Council has not yet endorsed the plan in any way. What's currently on there is from the various stakeholders that provided feedback to date, so we need to hear those kind of things in feedback if there is community concern. All right, so, <coughs> yeah. When will, the, when, when will the community get to comment on the proposed um, TPS? Uh, 11. Uh, local planning scheme 11. Yep. So I think I believe Mr Gibson just got further feedback from the department um, on Friday. Are you able to offer? And there's a plan I hope for <coughs> to come to council in August. Would that be correct? Uh, yes, through yeah. Madam Mayor. Um, council had a special council meeting in November last year. Um, from there, the documents adopted by council for the purpose of advertising, for the purpose of instigating the process, were sent to the planning commission. Um, it went to the statutory planning committee. Uh, there were a few issues that needed to be resolved at the town's end. The town prepared a revised suite of documents and provided back to the department for some informal review. After almost uh, 10 weeks with the department, it came back to the town uh, a day or two ago. Um, so staff are now in the process of reviewing those comments from the department uh, and will determine uh, whether the matter can go to council for reconsideration August. At the very least, a report be put to uh, Council in August, uh, it's intended a, a report be put to Council in August to either have the matter formally reconsidered, or if that's not possible given the scale of the changes, at the very least an update for Council's consideration. I think, as you may well be aware, until we get permission from WAPC to advertise the scheme, we can't formally Okay, so, so, so when, when, when that permission is granted, exactly. we will get a chance to comment on it. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you. That, that answers that side because I'm sure people will um, comment that that's the only bit of public open space within 350 square metres of Bassendean Station and 
hints is a precious piece of public open space given the intensity that you're proposing. Um, I still haven't heard an answer on the second part on of Oval? my question about the Jackson Dean Oval. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the point is uh, broadly correct about uh, the Bassinet Oval being heritage listed. Um, staff, given the possibility of reducing the oval, um, was raised early on as part of the initial um, consultation processes. Uh, staff uh, inquired with the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage, uh, the heritage arm of the DPLH, um, and that heritage arm raised little concerns um, with the reduction in the size of the oval. Uh, that said, it was an informal comment from the department and any material changes uh, would need to go through a full and formal process. But for the purpose of the master plan, the department had no major concerns. Thank you. I find that incredible, but thank you. All right, unless anyone has a burning question, we might move on. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, so, we're on to item 8, which is petitions, which we have not received any. Um, item 9 is the confirmation of the minutes. So, first of all, we have the Ordinary Council meeting um, at 9.1a. That was held on the 22nd of June. Do I have a mover that those minutes be received? Councillor William, seconded by Councillor Quinton. Is there anybody against? So, that is carried. Now, in relation to 9.1b, this is confirmation that they are a true record. Um, I'd like to move an amendment to what is recorded in the minutes. So um, I'll just read that out. So uh, that the Ordinary Council minutes dated the 22nd of June 2021 be confirmed as a true record, subject to the following amendment being made to item 16.1, variation to contract OCM 23621, um, to delete the resolution that states, um, the resolution is included in the minutes there, um, it is listed as a vote being taken as an absolute majority and it not being achieved with a vote being 3-2. Um, the record needs to be amended to state that the matter was not dealt with in accordance with the county council meeting procedures local law 2020 and no vote was taken. So I move to confirm those minutes as a true record with that amendment. Is that seconding? Councillor Wilson has seconded. Is there anybody against? That is carried. So then 9.2 is the special council meeting that followed the ordinary council meeting to deal with that issue that was just highlighted. So 9.2A is to confirm, um, is to receive those minutes. Is there a mover for that please? Councillor Quinton, a seconder. Councillor McWilliam, is there anybody against? That is carried. And 9.2B that they're confirmed as a true record. Moved by Councillor Quinton, seconded Councillor McLennan. Anybody against? That is carried. There was no business deferred, so we'll move on to item 11, which is the external committee reports <coughs> updates. Um, so 11.1 is the receipt of external committees. Um, that was the Welga East Metro Zone meeting and the EMRC Ordinary Council meeting abridged minutes. Is there a mover um, to receive those? Councillor Wilson, a seconder. Councillor Hamilton, is there anybody against? That is carried. So item 12, councillors, is the reports on tonight's agenda. 12.1 is the adoption of recommendations on block. So at the moment, the, the following items are coming out of on block. We have 12 12.2, 12.5, 12.7, 12.9, 12.10, 12.12, 12.13, 12.14, 16.1 and 16.2. Are there any others, Councillor Ganjo? Yes, thank you, 12.3. <laughs> okay. <coughs> any others, Councillor? Yes, Councillor Wilson? Sorry, 12.13 uh, is coming in. 12.13 is out, yes. Okay, so if there's no others that councillors would like to take out, is there a mover for the remainder to be carried on block? Councillor Wilson moved, a seconder. Councillor Quinton, is there anybody against? That is carried. So we'll go to item 12, excuse me, 12.2. It's the disposal of town property of 1 Surrey Street in Bassendine. And just um, in the minutes, sorry, in the agenda there, it records it requires a simple majority. It actually requires an absolute majority, which won't make any difference tonight, considering we have seven councillors present. First of all, any questions councillors may have for 
staff. That's my printed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A uh, uh, question for the staff. Um, just wanting to get a real understanding about the EOI process. I understand under the EOI process there was an opportunity for any entity, anyone outside the town or inside the town, to put forward a submission to lease, purchase, uh, and there was another option. I just wanted to get an understanding about um, how many submissions we received, and of those submissions, uh, how many um, put forward an option for a lease? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, under the Local Government Act, disposition is uh, can entail a sale, uh, a lease, or a license. Um, so, as Councillor Quinton suggests, it would have been open to anyone from inside or outside the district to put forward a proposal to acquire the site on those terms. Um, in undertaking the EOI process, we received responses from two uh, entities, uh, one of which effectively put two proposals forward, one for a purchase in the, in the typical sense, and one for a lease arrangement. Um, so whilst we had two responses, we effectively received three proposals, uh, two which were for a sale, um, and one which was for a lease. They were assessed by staff, um, and which led to the, uh, the May agenda item considered by Council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> another question. So, um, were any of the submissions, probably can't say that, was the National Trust ever involved in a conversation with the town about leasing Surrey Street? Have you ever had a conversation with them about taking on a lease, us owning it and then taking on a lease? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, we had conversations with the National Trust early on um, to gauge their interest in them having a stake in the property, be it a, a lease or a purchase. Um, they did uh, certainly consider the matter. Their, their CEO attended the site to meet with town staff to discuss it. Uh, he took the matter back to his board um, where they respectfully declined to uh, be involved in the property. Uh, and all of that occurred prior to the EOI. So should, um, under a lease arrangement, what kind of financial position would the town be in if we were to have leased to that, to the person or entity that submitted uh, to take on a lease? What financial position, what um, obligations would we be being un under uh, if we'd gone into a lease, into to taking that, that lease option? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I suppose it depends on the, the terms of the lease, but in terms of the commercial return, uh, a peppercorn lease would not be materially different to what is effectively on offer as part of this report, which is a sale for a single dollar. Um, so this proposed or potential disposition is not returning a commercial return for the town uh, in a similar way that a peppercorn rent would not have returned a commercial return. Good now to my question. What obligation would we be under uh, for the restoration, maybe that wasn't clear enough, for the restoration of the building if we leased it, if we lease it out? Would we still have to be maintaining it? Would we still have to restore it? Um, and it, that kind of stuff. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I suppose it depends on the terms of the lease, but given the manner in which the EOI was undertaken, and that was undertaken on the basis of two key measures as dictated by Council, they were A, community access, and B, heritage restoration. So if we were to presume that a lease would have been undertaken or entered into on that basis, um, there would, you'd imagine there would be an expectation on the leasing entity to actually undertake those works. Uh, but again, that would depend <coughs> on the proposal put forward to the town and the terms that the council accepted. Mm. And just if we were under the obligation as a <coughs> government entity, is it your understanding that we usually have to pay a premium for any works that are undertaken in heritage properties or any kind of properties that we take? A, I know we've gone through heaps of contracts where we've had to pay a premium because we're a government entity. Is that is that your understanding? Is that is that a true statement? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, it might be one that uh, Mr Adams uh, would like to add to, but I suppose anecdotally the advice is that 
because of the procurement policy and the uh, purchasing restrictions that apply to a government entity that don't apply to the private sector, from time to time, um, a local government would have to pay more than the private sector. Whether that's a fair comment, I'll defer to my colleague. Um, yeah, thanks, Luke. Um, to you, Madam Mayor. The, yeah, that um, seems to be the way it um, it, uh, it goes most of the time. That um, during through our purchasing requirements, we do end up paying a bit more on private enterprise when when it comes to these things. Yeah. Mm, okay. Council I'll let others ask yeah. questions. Other questions from councillors, Councillor Wilson, and then Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, there was a, a statement made during um, public statement time, um, words to the effect that uh, once it is sold, uh, that's it, it can't be reversed. Is, is that your understanding of the effect of the um, officer recommendation? Uh, is, is it possible for the sale to be reversed, and if so, under what conditions? Uh, through Madam Mayor. Um, Yes, if, it, if a condition is imposed on the contract of sale to allow a what is you know, colloquially referred to as a buyback clause, um, and that is what is being recommended in this instance, um, the second last dot point on page 15 of 91 of the agenda um, states that the recommended condition is if the restoration is not completed within four years or such other time as agreed with the council, the town is able to purchase back the site for one dollar. So if council resolves as recommended, that would be embedded into the contract. Councillor Hamilton. Um, going back to a potential lease situation, given we have many leased properties in the town, town owned properties are leased, um, I understand that there is a, a significant um, cost to us in maintaining those properties um, perhaps uh, you would like to, would you say that's a true statement that we carry a significant cost, maintenance cost for all the properties that we lease? Uh, through you Madam Mayor, I think that would be a fair statement. Uh, at the local government we own a series of uh, <coughs> properties uh, and we uh, issued a management order for a number more uh, and those contain buildings such as the one we're in right now. All of those buildings require maintenance, upkeep, and therefore expense. Um, there has been a, a lot of discussion and um, about the grant money, three hundred seventy-five thousand, being returned. Is it correct that, um, from a timeline point of view, it came to a point where we could not accomplish? the restoration works, the proposals within the timeline and actually the grant more or less expired for lack of a better word. Would you agree with that statement? Thank you. 
Um, another question? While you're thinking about it. Yeah. Um, Mr Gibson, I had the opportunity to ask you some questions um, in the last couple of days. Um, there have been some community members raising concerns about the changing use that was required prior to the end of Perth's um, proposal that was accepted by Council. Um, I've had the benefit of hearing the response to that. Would you mind um, just speaking to that point for the benefit of other councillors, please? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, this question was raised last week, but broadly um, the process Council is considering at the moment is simply the disposition of land, um, whilst that will, if uh, Council resolved as recommended, uh, result in a, a transaction and a change of ownership, um, Council is not at this stage being asked to consider any application for development approval. Uh, if it is that the Museum of Perth uh, successfully acquires the site off the town uh, and wishes to change the use of the land to, say, a research facility or community purpose or educational establishment, um, that would require uh, an application for development approval to be lodged. All of those uses, incidentally, are able to be contemplated on the subject site. Uh, the matter the council would need to consider is whether the scale of any development is appropriate in that location. Um, without jumping too far ahead into a process that hasn't started, uh, council, it would be reasonable for council to consider the decision that was made uh, in 2019, September 2019, to approve the application for 2C. Um, and so long as the any proposed use of the land was not more no more impactful than that, uh, it might be reasonable to mount an argument that it's appropriate to be approved. But that at this stage is simply speculation because we haven't been presented an application to assess in detail. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton, can you remember your question? I can, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Are there any further questions, councillors? Councillor Quinton? Yes, I just want to ask some questions about the caveat on the title. Uh, I did hear the briefing session last week um, and Rhys Harley made a deputation around a legal requirement of, inco is it incorporated uh, or uh, the entity needing to have um, a winding up clause? That's in the constitution. In the constitution. So what kind, what legal rights is that? What, what, uh, if that's on the title, what, can you just spell that out for me so I can really clearly understand what that winding up clause means? Please. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, the winding up clause has nothing to do with the title that's part of uh, the Museum of Perth's Constitution. The caveat, which is proposed to be registered on the title, is a proprietary encumbrance um, that limits what can and can't happen on the site. Uh, and the purpose of putting the caveat on there would be to restrict any uh, future land transactions. Uh, to enable the enable council's requirements to be transferred to a prospective purchaser. Uh, that is somewhat independent of uh, the Museum of Perth's constitution. But maybe you could explain the winding up clause for Councillor Quinton as well and what that means if the Museum of Perth failed to exist in the future. Sorry. Uh, through you, Madam as I understand it. Um, just to clarify that last point, my understanding is a winding up clause is a legal requirement in a not-for-profit in their constitution. Um, and I've read it and it says that upon dissolution, the property assets must be transferred to a tier of government or similar institution with similar goals. So that's my 
understanding um, that it's a legal requirement. It just is. Um, through the there, I'd have to check the. Uh, may well be. I'm not an expert on sort of charity legislation. <coughs> it may well be a legal requirement to be the ACNC. Right. So whilst we're on the Constitution, um, I also know that um, the objects of association um, can be amended with an entity, a not-for-profit, where they can um, change and affirm their new role if they were acquired this property, they could affirm their new role as custodians of um, this heritage site. And um, would it be possible to have, when I know that we've already engaged with the town's lawyers in respect to um, compo creating a caveat, but would it be possible to create or talk to the lawyers about these association rules as well and to engage with the applicant if he's successful? Uh, through Madam Mayor, yes, I'm sure that would be possible. Okay. <coughs> Councillor Gangel. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm just wondering, you might not be able to answer this question uh, right at the moment, but uh, on the town's asset and land register, what do we have the value of this site at? No, I didn't, I didn't think you would, but there's a follow-up follow question I want, I, I want to ask, just in relation to that, because obviously uh, my understanding is, and feel free to correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, so the asset and land register, what land we have and assets we have, that then uh, affects how much we can ultimately borrow. Uh, so if we ever need to get a loan, we obviously loan against the, the assets and loan capabilities of the, within the town, within rates and, and what land earnings we have. Is that accurate to say that? Um, for all the So I'm just, just wondering, with the acquis potential acquisition of this property, that then doesn't affect that capacity then? Is that what, what you're saying? Uh, I wouldn't have thought so, okay. Councillor, no. Thank you. Okay, Councillor, so are there any further questions? Okay, so we have an officer recommendation before us, so we either need someone to move the officer recommendation or an alternative. Councillor Wilson? <coughs> I'll move the officer recommendation. Okay, so Councillor Wilson would like to move the officer recommendation. Is there a seconder for the officer recommendation? Councillor against? Would you like to open debate, Councillor Wilson? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, <coughs> so while not reflecting in any way on any of the decisions made by Council, it's, it's a matter of public record that I've consistently supported a, an approach to the use of this building which was to make it a community hub that would house the Infant Health Centre and uh, for many of the reasons that have been discussed by staff uh, this evening, uh, primarily those around the amount of funding that would be required to achieve that vision. Uh, that point of view uh, was not su ultimately successful uh, and uh, Council voted to go down the path of, of looking at other options. Um, since that time, I've also been consistently of the view that if we as a Council don't have the funds uh, to be able to realise the best and highest use of this asset, then uh, the best thing for us is to find someone with the resources, the drive, uh, the passion uh, to be able to restore this building uh, to its uh, former glory and give it some renewed sense of purpose. Um, so for that reason, um, I've supported the motions um, following uh, us deciding not to go down the path of making it an infant health centre uh, up to this point and why I'm happy to support the officer recommendation. There's regrettably been some, I think, inaccurate, emotive and divisive language uh, used around the public discussion on this item uh, that I don't think reflects well on many people. Um, comments such as, once it's gone, it can never be brought back again when the motion itself specifically says 
uh, if the resolution, uh, if the restoration is not completed within four years, the town is able to purchase the site back for one dollar. I mean, it, it's there in black and white in the resolution. It doesn't bear further reflection beyond that. Uh, what I, what I would say is that I am confident that the staff and the administration have gone through a thorough due diligence process and assessment process. Uh, I'm confident uh, that the Perth History Association trading as the Museum of Perth uh, does have a, a sufficient track record, uh, the drive and the capacity to be able to deliver on this and I'm confident that should this not come to pass that within four years time the town has the ability to regain access uh, of the asset or the sale price of one dollar. So, uh, we've had a crack at it. I think our town's stewardship of this asset for the past 20 or 30 years could probably be best described as benign neglect. No. Um, it, oh, I crave your protection, your worship, from Terrible. constant interjection. Uh, and someone else should be given a crack to do better than we have. And Absolutely. if that Okay, comes excuse me, can we just have some quiet, please, so Councillor Wilson can speak? Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and I heartily invite, as has been suggested, that uh, there are elections coming up in October, I heartily invite members of the community who are passionate about this and believably have made the wrong decision to run on that basis and to seek to represent the community from this table. Thank you. Um, just before I give you the opportunity to speak, Councillor William, um, I just wanted to a minute take her. At the moment, the officer recommendation under item 12.2, just to make sure we've all got the correct wording. So. Can we ch make sure with Councillor Wilson and Councillor McWilliams indulgence that it should read council agrees to one, sell one, sorry, street, and then two. Yes, yep, great. Thank you. Okay. Councillor McWilliam, would you like to speak? Yes, I would, Your Worship, thank you. Um, yes, I concur with, uh, with Councillor Wilson in terms of the um, disparate and confusing amount of information that has been misrepresented in the, in the public um, discussion that has gone on, um, uh, people have um, reacted and um, seen fit to actually s to um, misrepresent the situation. Uh, well, I would like to say that um, this sort of arrangement is not, un it, it's not it's, it is quite common. Um, just because people haven't come across it that much doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Uh, it is something that has been used for a very long time to make sure that things don't fall into complete disarray, that um, the people who have, this, as Councillor Wilson said, uh, expressed, people who have the experience and the knowledge and the wherewithal to actually make um, make a, um, a deal with um, whoever the entity is, in this case the town of Bassendean, uh, takes on this role for the cost of one dollar and then proceeds to provide $50,000 a year for four years. So for those that are saying that this is, doesn't represent the value of the property, I think it comes very close to representing the property of the, the value of the property. Thank you, Councillor McWilliam. Excuse me. Councillor Ganji, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Look, I've been uh, consistent in my view that uh, this should remain uh, in community hands uh, in the town, uh, part of the town uh, assets. Uh, this has been uh, a long-going project and, and uh, I will actually take uh, exception to Councillor Wilson's uh, uh, comment regarding benign neglect by previous councils. That is completely and utterly uh, untrue. Uh, previous councils have worked very hard and put a lot of expense to do up plans uh, to get uh, to get uh, funding allocations, which this council actually gave back. If you talk about uh, benign neglect, giving back three hundred and seventy-five thousand uh, dollars, previous councils actually got to a stage where we had a plan and we were ready to go. Uh, we had it costed, we had it funded, we had uh, additional funding coming into the town. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what ultimately occurred was a change. Uh, of direction, but at the end of the day, what we have here is not a magic pudding. Uh, it's not something uh, that will ultimately uh, betterment uh, the town. Uh, we're talking about an organisation, and I have nothing against the organisation, but an organisation that will uh, has our, has indicated they will contribute uh, fifty thousand dollars a year to this site. Well, it's a very sad day where this council gives away a key asset in our town for $50,000 a year that this council will not commit to. 
In that same period of time, uh, on current trajectory, uh, the council would uh, would spend in four years probably four million uh, on uh, on trees, but can't find fifty thousand for uh, our number one heritage asset in the town. Uh, it's all about, and it has been said before, it is absolutely all about priorities. It's about where the priorities lie, and is it about making sure we have a broad mix? Make sure we have a broad mix of the environment, of our heritage, of our infrastructure. Uh, there was a comment made earlier by uh, the Deputy Mayor that, oh, well, an asset costs money. Well, every asset costs money in the town. That's why we're a town, because we have things to look after uh, for the betterment of our community. Uh, and I just reiterate again, it is a very, very sad day that the town is, is giving away, and it's largely giving away, uh, for uh, a dollar, which will contribute uh, $50,000 uh, each year under what's proposed for restoration. Well, this council, this very council, should be able to <coughs> do exactly the same thing, keep this in community hands, and as Councillor Wilson said, uh, if you want the resources and drive, uh, to do something, you give it to the community, you make the community part of it, and uh, for $50,000, I think this council can actually look at its priorities and make sure we can keep this in our community's hands. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gantel. Okay, I appreciate that people have liked Councillor Gantel's debate, but I need to ask you all to refrain from contributing. Are there any councillors who would like to speak for the motion? Councillor Hamilton? <coughs> Okay, um, I appreciate that there have been volunteers that have contributed a great deal of time and energy um, to the Pensioner Guard Cottage. I appreciate that there are divergent views about what should have happened to the residents. Um, there are some positives to come out of all of this <coughs> debate. One thing's for sure, with all the advertising and the social media, we now know that most people in the town are aware of Surrey Street, which is a positive. Um, I also know that when I came onto council in 2017, I spent my first Christmas reading a pile of documents about Surrey Street this deep. And I recall being astonished. That would be the word, astonished at the multiple iterations of plans. At the time, I thought this must have cost a pretty penny. And um, interp I read various interpretation plans. Um, I do understand that there was uh, a certain desire to have it as a museum. I also read the officers' reports about the running costs for a museum, which was prohibitive not to this council, but to a previous council from years ago. They were not going to entertain a museum because the costs, the running costs, were prohibitive. So, you know, there have been multiple input. And I said once before that maybe the problem, the 30 years of problems with this site, was that there were too many cooks running the kitchen. And it, it clearly, my aspiration for this site is full restoration. That's what I've always wanted. From day one, I've wanted this site to be fully restored. I have tried in various times to talk about reducing the scale of the project. I know that there are people in this audience that I spent a great deal of time talking to them about reducing the scale. And I also know that the grant from Lottery Express was tied to four entities all agreeing. Bassanine Historical Society, the town, National Trust, and the other entity whose name escapes me at the moment. So, again, I would say that all of these people, in the end, it became inaction. There were so many drivers for this project about going in different directions and wanting this and wanting that. In the end, it actually became an inactive project, and that is a tragedy. It's demolition by neglect. I'm sorry, it is really dreadful that it's demolition by neglect. So I would suggest that we up, need a different Wilson. way. Thank you. Speaker against? Any other speakers? Councillor um, Quinton first and then Councillor Barty. Thank you. 
Um, this project, when, when these really difficult um, uh, questions come before us, it becomes a question of values for me. It's a similar incident when we had the um, decision about the men's shed. It was about values for me. This, again, is about values. Um, it must have been a very sad day when under your tender you sold the Masonic Lodge. That must have been a sad mm. day. Uh, so this is, not, this is a similar situation, Councillor Gangel. Um, but we do, and one of the two, two core values that I keep coming to about this project, and I have spoken to people in the community about wanting coming to the decision about this, is that the, the building gets restored and the community get to use it. I have read every single word of every single document that's been put forward by the Museum of Perth and the Bassendine Historical Society, and each of those satisfied a core value of community use. The one that had a greater value of and financial stability to have any um, restoration of the building was the Museum of Perth. They have constantly, and I'm reading this, they've reached out to community groups and said they will be able to use it whenever they want. The cottage will be open at all times. We're okay with putting a caveat on the title so that um, it doesn't fall into another person's hands. We, we, we are going to have, we have a clause in our constitution that says if, they're, if we're winding up, we'll hand it over to someone else. I don't think that this is going to be lost to our community. I think this is something that we will get to keep. It'll get better and our community will continue to use it. It was a very, very sad day for me when we had to um, not go ahead with the plans to put the Infant Health Centre in. It was the reason I ran for council and I actually get really emotional about it now because it would have been beautiful. It would have been beautiful that residence was alive with children from the day it was built and we would have put children back into it. The historical context of that residence was about children and we would have had a beautiful building that would have given respect to our women and to our children, to our fathers. There would have been birthday parties on the weekends but it was going to cost $1.6 million that we just don't have. We just don't have that kind of money. We have to make priorities decisions. We couldn't go ahead with that project and I'm, I actually cried about it. I was really, really sad about it. So now we're in this position. We have to make a decision about what to do with this building and I go back to my core values. It gets community use and the building gets restored. Thank you Councillor Quinton. Councillor Barty. <coughs> yes, thank you Your Worship. Um, I'll keep this brief uh, because I think most of the points that I've I was going to speak to have been raised already. Um, I acknowledge that this is an emotive issue for our community uh, and I acknowledge that uh, the community may choose to come election time in, in October disagree with the position that council ultimately takes and that may, there may be a consequence that, uh, that I no longer get to serve on council uh, and that's okay, I, I accept that consequence. Uh, the decision that we make tonight may be unpopular, again that's okay. Um, I look forward to engaging with, with my neighbours in further discussions as the years go on about One Surrey Street. Uh, and I hope it's in a way that allows us to continue to get the most out of that facility. Uh, at this point in time, the residence is not functional. It cannot be used. It lays dormant. Uh, and we can, uh, as, as was uh, mentioned earlier, we could, over a number of years, set aside some funds in reserves uh, for this property. But the cost would be that this property continues to lay dormant and does not be used by the community. And that's something that we have to consider. When we think about the financial value to the community uh, about uh, this proposal, when I thought about it, and I acknowledge one dollar on paper is not a lot of money, but in order to fully restore this facility uh, to where it rightfully belongs, we would have had to do one of two things. Cut significant projects uh, and, uh, that were of value to the community or we would have had to pass on the cost of the rate payer and the value of the, the, the cost of the project uh, that would have uh, then gone on to the rate payer was not something that I was prepared to, to pass on. 
this is a question for me of capacity and I can only deal with the recommendations that are in front of me as I look at them. Am I satisfied that the, that the plan presented by the Museum of Perth will allow the community to access the facility? Yes, I am. Am I satisfied that the Museum of Perth has the facility to restore One Surrey Street to its, its uh, rightful place? I acknowledge that there is a leap of faith. There is a risk here, and I cannot deny that. But there are risks associated with everything that we do, and this is a risk that I'm willing to take for the benefit of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barty. I don't particularly feel the need to speak, seeing as so many other people have spoken, so if you'd like to um, have your right of reply, Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I'd like to thank all councillors for their considered contribution to the debate. Um, I think Councillor Quinton summed it up well when she said that the building can't be taken anywhere. It's going to stay in our community. It's not going to be put on <coughs> the back of a truck and taken somewhere else. Um, the officer recommendation um, that I've moved and used to have majority support uh, will require that community access be maintained and it will lead to a situation where the building will be restored uh, with money that is not our neighbour's money. It will be restored with other people's money and should that not come to pass, there is a provision for future councils to take that <coughs> ownership of the asset if they wanted to. And, and I would note, um, as Councillor Quinton pointed out, uh, when the Masonic Lodge was sold, there was no uh, requirement for community access. The, the sprung wooden dance floor in there that so many people in our community enjoyed uh, is now privately accessed by whoever owns it. I don't know, I think it was sold again recently to a, another private owner and there is no community access. And I, I can't remember the same level of outrage about that sale, but perhaps I wasn't paying attention at the time. Mm -hmm. That said, I support the officer recommendation and I thank councillors for their contributions. Okay, councillors, so I'll put that to the vote. So all those in favour of the officer recommendation? Councillor Wilson, Quinton, Barty, Hamilton, McWilliam and McLennan and against is Councillor Gangel, so that is carried by an absolute majority. Thank you everyone that has contributed and thank you members of the community. We'd like to spend a few minutes for people to leave. Okay, councillors. Um, so item 12.3 is proposed tree preservation order. Councillor Gangel, you wanted that out of envelope? Yes, thank you, Your Worship. You just wish to debate against oh, it, I no, imagine? Oh, I no, have, I have a couple of questions. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Rightio. When this comes forward, I always like asking this question. Let's see if we've had an update uh, in the pursuing months. Uh, can I ask the staff how many trees on council councillors' own properties are uh, their tree preservations orders on? Councillor Gangel, you've asked this question multiple times. Uh, it's um, not relevant. It is very, no, no, it is very much relevant, Councilor Your Worship. Gangel, it's it is, not relevant it is to the very item. It is very much Please relevant. Please be quiet. Other questions, councillors? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'll Councilor ask my question Gangel, again. I, uh, you do not have the right to... If you don't like something, you just shut it down. That's your MO. That's how I you operate. I am the presiding member. You've asked well, that question multiple okay. times. Okay, clearly you don't want the answer. No. Thank you. Um, Councillor Gangel. Well, I've got another question. I'm going to ask questions no, now because you, you don't agree with my point. Councillor okay. Gangel, okay. this is not yeah. appropriate. <laughs> Councillor Quinton, can you please ask your question? I didn't have one. I was um, lolling at Councillor right. Gangel because I, I'll put my application in tomorrow for a, the pine tree in the front yard. If I just get it, I will, I will do that. Okay, thank you. Do you have another question, Councillor Gangel, that you've not asked multiple times before? Well, I just want clarification from the officers if I'm allowed to have that. It may disagree from your view, Your Worship, so you may rule it out of order. Um, I'm just wanting to know, the matrix which we go to look at this when the trees are nominated is simply that a tree needs to be nominated for a recommendation to endorse? No, that's not correct. Would you like to provide some details, Mr Gibson? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, through you. Um, the scheme, uh, LPS 10, as well as Council's local plan policy 13, sets the criteria. Uh, I believe what Councillor Gangel was referring to is a question from last week 
where he asked what the difference was between this tree and any other tree in the district. And my response to that was that this tree had been nominated, just as any other tree in the district could be nominated. Uh, if other trees were nominated, um, they would be assessed against the same parameters in the scheme and the policy and be considered uh, for possible inclusion <coughs> of the tree preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Then further that, can I ask what, what's special about this tree that makes it unique for it to actually have a tree <coughs> preservation order and everything that comes along with that? So you did ask that question last week, Councillor Gadgel. Would you like the answer repeated? Yes, thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, the tree was nominated uh, on the basis of its aesthetic quality, its age being circa 1970s, its rarity and it being a food source for nectar eating fauna. Um, LPS 10 sets out uh, a number of criteria um, that Council uh, is required to have regard to. That includes aesthetic quality, historical association, rarity or any other characteristics. Councillor Quinton. I move the motion. Thank you. I'm happy to second it. Councillor Ganger, you're against. Would you like to debate Councillor Quinton? Yes, thank you. Um, we are in an environment where the State Government uh, is not... How should I put this? Uh, doesn't have the courage to give, up, give local governments a blanket legislation on preserving trees. So it has to be done on an ad hoc basis. The greatest power we have to protect trees on private properties is tree preservation orders or under our planning scheme uh, with the square, one tree per how many square metres now? Four? You mean the no. tree preservation retention policy that yes, we adopted? Yes, thank you. Uh, through Madam Mayor, it's one tree per 300 square metres. Thank you. So we have to do everything that we can to preserve trees on private property. We have our own trees on our verges, which we are allowed to preserve. Uh, so we should use every mechanism in our power to preserve trees. If someone wants to put a tree preservation order on a tree, let them. I think the sticking point with this item is that this is owned by the state government, this house. Oh, I, I think that I think our, us sending a message to the Department of Communities that they should be more mindful about trees on their properties. Should this, perhaps we're the first to let them know uh, that if they're gonna knock down and develop land, their own state government land, that they should be mindful about trees on their properties. And I think it's wonderful that we can send them that message. So I wholeheartedly approve this. Thank you, Councillor Quinton. Um, I echo your thoughts. Consistently, the feedback from our community is the retention of mature canopy in our town is extremely high, if not the highest priority for members of our community. At present, there are significant limitations on our ability to protect trees, and this, as Councillor Quinton pointed out, is largely due to the state planning framework not recognising the value of trees, and that results in many mature trees being removed. And I think that's tragic, and I know a lot of our community members are also troubled by this. I'm grateful that our town planning scheme, which um, you may have been the mayor at the time, Councillor Gangel, introduced tree protection orders into our scheme to allow us to have these powers. Um, as councillors are aware, there is nothing to stop the tree preservation or being removed at a later date if there was a valid reason to do so. But what this does do is ensure that the tree is protected at present while there is no need for it to be removed. And even if a conversation is had in future, there, it provides the opportunity for the town staff to discuss um, variations to develop in the development application that will allow for the retention of a tree. This particular tree is located at the front of a property and does not impact on the development potential of that site. So there is no reason for us to reject this tree preservation order. I would encourage members of our community to, while they're walking around our beautiful town, to take note of mature trees on sites within our town, particularly in areas around our town centre and those that are marked for higher density and to submit tree preservation orders because the more canopy that we can um, retain on private property, the better outcome we're gonna have for our community. So I would strongly encourage councillors to support this tree preservation order and our community to submit, submit many more so that we can protect trees within our town. Councillor Ganjo. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I got elected uh, in 2005. Uh, at my election, uh, there was great controversy about a, land, uh, a mass amount of trees being cleared from, uh, from a block of land. Uh, that block was one Anzac Terrace. 
Uh, so uh, I believe that's where you currently reside, Your Worship. I don't know if you did decide not to buy a house in that block because of the protest of the mass clearing that happened at one Anzac Terrace. I think this is a very, very dangerous precedent to go under. None of the councillors here have a tree preservation order and none of us have uh, what is uh, required to be impinged on us through a tree preservation order. Uh, we had a young couple uh, in this chamber in tears uh, about uh, obviously the impact that they will have on their future lifestyle. Now we have a situation where uh, individuals, third parties, can go any tree in the town, any for sale sign that's up, and list every single tree uh, that's on that block or in that, in that piece of land with the Mayor encouraging mass amount of tree preservation orders to be put by third parties on individual land. That is a very, very dangerous precedent to set. That is sending a sing single that, signal that uh, it, is, uh, it is anybody's right to, to impinge on other people's uh, land. Uh, I have always supported individuals who wish to have tree preservation orders on their own land. I don't have an issue with that. I encourage that. What I will not support uh, is when a third party uh, goes around and decides they will single-handedly put uh, a tree preservation order on somebody else's property and, and this council not have a clear matrix for what is a tree preservation. So what actually makes uh, a tree in a, in, uh, required for preservation? Uh, this is a very, very dangerous precinct to go down where any third party can list a tree, get an application, come to council and what we're seeing here tonight is basically it will be recommended to put a tree preservation order and all, and all the requirements on that, including not being able to prune your tree uh, on your own property, uh, but the young couple won't be able to have a pool, won't be able to extend, extend their property, as they mentioned earlier. This is a very dangerous precedent to go under, uh, and I would urge councillors uh, not to be supporting such an extremist situation. Thank okay, you. Before anyone else speaks, I'd like to ask the staff to just um, potentially correct the record on a number of statements Councillor Ganjul made. So particularly, he made the comment, any tree. He made the comment that any third party, where it's a council decision, not any third party, um, and that um, people are not able to prune their trees, where my understanding is that these require permission um, for approval before that occurs. Is there a bit of comment on those, just to provide clarification, please? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, starting with the last one, yes, that is correct. Um, the restriction provided in the scheme simply requires consent to be provided from the town, uh, whereas otherwise that consent would not be required. Uh, any tree can be nominated um, by anyone under the current framework, and so the council could change that if it so chooses. Uh, but just because a tree is nominated does not necessarily make it so that it, a tree preservation order will be made. It still needs to be assessed against the scheme and the policy to determine whether it's appropriate uh, for a tree preservation order. As I said last week, uh, it is open to council to increase or decrease the threshold uh, of what a tree must be or offer to be covered by a TPO make it harder or it can make it easier. Uh, but until that is changed, we have the, the framework as provided for in the report and applications will be assessed accordingly. Thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor Wilson? <coughs> uh, thank you, Worship. I rise to speak in favour of the officer recommendation. Um, I, I completely understand the respect to Councillor Gangel's sincerely held view that if people want to put a or apply for a tree preservation order on their own trees, then you know, that's one thing, but for potentially anonymous strangers to come and make an application uh, on a tree on your property, that's something else entirely. Um, and you know, I respect Councillor Gangel's right to pursue that policy position uh, while he's on council to get the town planning scheme amended and the tree policy amended. Um, currently, though, <coughs> the way the policy is framed is that this is possible. Um, I look at the tree, I don't know anything uh, particularly special about this tree, but I'll take the officer advice on face value that it provides food for uh, nectar eating birds in our community and you know, it, it's important that we maintain that. It doesn't mean that the tree is there forever, but it creates a process where the tree's existence has to be considered as a part of the development. And for anyone playing at home, there is a tree, uh, a married tree that I planted in my backyard over the placenta of my youngest child. Uh, I invite any member of the community, anonymously or otherwise, 
to make an application for that tree preservation order. I can't make it for myself and then judge my own application, but um, I'm happy for such an order to be made. Thank you. Any other speakers? Um, okay, so right of reply. Oh, I'm only, um, only to say that I look forward to John Ga Councillor Gangel nominating my tree in my front yard for a tree preservation order. Although after what I've just heard him say, I don't think he's going to do that. Um, but uh, if Councillor Gangel doesn't like the policy that we have in place, Councillor Gangel can bring the policy back for us to debate. It's our policy, we've all agreed on it. Uh, so um, if he doesn't like it, perhaps bring it back and we'll get a change. Don't doubt that's I gonna happen though. <laughs> okay, thank you councillors. All right, so we'll put that to the vote. <laughs> All those in favour? Council so, oh, <laughs> oh, 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 very fraudulent. Very fraudulent there. Fraudulent. Fraudulent. Okay, <laughs> councillors. Four is Councillor Wilson, Quinton, Barty, Hamilton, William and McLennan, and against is Councillor Ganjo, and that you. is carried. I'm sure you don't want to change your mind there, Councillor Ganjo. One of those. Item 12.5, um, it's the development application for the existing carport at Patio at 50 Faulkner Way, Eden Hill. Um, any questions to begin with? Yes. When you're ready, I'll move the officer's recommendation. Great, I think we're ready. Is there a seconder? Councillor Wilson, is there anybody against? That is carried unanimously. Uh, 12.6 is the purchase of lot 304 Kenny Street as part of Town Planning Scheme 4A. Are there any questions? Do we have a mover? Councillor Wilson, is that a movie? Yeah, I've got a question. Oh, sorry. Yes. <coughs> um, and it, it's a question I've asked a number of times, and I, I don't mean to do so out of belligerence or repetition, but I, I, I just don't understand the answer to it. Well, what are the consequences of us not resolving the four other scheme? <coughs> well, I, I appreciate that the 4 scheme exists, but if we don't do anything about it, what's going to happen? This guy uh, through you, Madam Mayor, relatively little. Um, but I think it was late 2019 when Council passed a resolution that it was one of its highest priorities at the time. Uh, and staff have made arrangements accordingly, but uh, in terms of Councillor Wilson's question, uh, this guide development scheme has been existence for a good number of years um, with relatively little consequence apart from having a, a date framework on the books. Um, if it is not uh, wound up in the next five years um, there will be no meaningful issues with that but uh, Council has previously expressed an interest in having it resolved sooner rather than later. Can I just clarify to add to that um, in terms of some of Council's obligation for purchasing sites to wind up the scheme um, I understand that there's potential for um, the property owners that currently have land that's flagged for the town to take for a public open space at any time could put in an application and then the town would be required to um, purchase those sites. So there is that obligation that would hang over council's head for the indefinite period of the scheme remaining live? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, that's broadly correct. The obligation to acquire is born effectively from both uh, TPS4A as well as local planning scheme number 10, uh, it would be open to those landowners to lodge an application with a view to having it refused on the basis that it's local open space and that refusal uh, triggering a claim for compensation. That said, we have been in discussion with all the affected landowners, uh, so the risk of that is relatively low. Um, in terms of the agenda item, uh, this is a matter that was broadly agreed in principle with the applicant, so there is no risk of anything of that nature. Thank you. Councillor Wilson? Okay, so Councillor Wilson's moved. Councillor Hamilton seconded. Is there anybody against? So that is carried unanimously. 12.7 is the proposed change of use um, to use not listed for a function centre and creative space. Any questions to begin with? Okay, do we have a mover for the officer recommendation? Councillor Quinton moved, seconded by Councillor Barty. Is there anybody against? So that is carried unanimously. 12.9 uh, is the draft local heritage survey. Um, so our CEO has brought to my attention um, a wish for the staff to make an amendment to the officer recommendation for this item. Uh, that's correct. So uh, the inclusion <coughs> of um, that subject to the thematic history section being reviewed to the satisfaction of the Chief Executive Officer, Council endorses the draft local heritage survey 
as contained as an attachment to this report for the purpose of advertising for public comment. And that addresses the concerns that were expressed in an email this afternoon um, by Mrs Carter. And just to clarify, I believe you've had a conversation with Mrs Carter since and she was agreeable to this? Absolutely, I discussed it with her and she was happy to work with the town on um, addressing the thematic history. Councillor Hobson, do you have a question? I do. So if, if that needs to be um, resolved, is there any problem in deferring this item until August, the August OCM? Uh, that would uh, depend on when the uh, thematic history is completed by. So the so way the, um, sorry, the recommendation is now proposed to be worded, um, if council are broadly The only reason I suggest deferral is because um, it's quite a dense document. And, um, so Councillor Hamilton, if you'd like to propose a deferral, you're welcome to do I would so. Like to propose okay, so Councillor Hamilton is moving to defer this item, um, subject to the, the, uh, the thematic history section being reviewed to the satisfaction of the CEO and to when come back to the August meeting. Would that be? It may not. It's quite a big section. Um, yes, I know. Yes, the <laughs> thematic history is quite a. Um, could be required to uh, sort of go back and forth uh, a fair bit, so I would suggest um, a longer time frame on that. Council well, how about when you're ready? Okay. So. Thank you. All right, so we'd like some official wording for our minute taker. Um, uh, um, defer, uh, defer this item pending um, uh, further work on the, work on the uh, history section. Do you foresee any promise of deferring this, Mr. Gibson? Uh, query, Madam Mayor, not particularly. All right, so we've got a mover to defer. Is there a seconder? Councillor Wilson, a seconded. Yes. Is there anybody against? So that is carried. Councillor Hobbiton, would you like to provide some reasons for the minute taker for why the officer recommendation hasn't been? Uh, shall I do that at the end? Is, is that a procedural motion? It's not an alternative. Well, I see you just requested there was a reason. If, if there's a deviation from the officer recommendation. So even for a procedural motion? Okay, so maybe we can address it after the meeting. Um, so 12.10 then, councillors. It's the licence agreement for the Telecom Community Cinemas. Any questions or is there a mover for the recommendation? Councillor Wilson, is that moving? Seconded by Councillor Barty. Everyone was keen there. Anybody against? Everyone. That is carried unanimously. 12 12 is FOGO in schools. Is that a moving or a second question? question? Councillor Please. Do we have any statistics on contamination rates in our current FOGO program? Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, the uh, latest statistics we have are from batch two, which is old at the moment, um, that's at 8%. We have received the information from EMRC about more current batches, but we haven't yet uh, examined them in detail. You know, we've just done the calculation. Okay, and did we have a monetary value for that 8%, did you say? Uh, sorry, I'm finding it hard to follow yet. Can we have that conversation later, Councillor Wilson? Councillor Quinton? Do we have a monetary value for that contamination of 8%? We do because it impacted the fees and charges from EMRC, but I'd have to refer back to the um, fees and charges and the decision of council as to how that actually impacted the fees. Okay. And um, the education program with the schools, who will be paying for that as well? Will that be on the teachers to do that, or will you be going into schools to do that? So the, there's multiple sources of funding for schools. Um, <coughs> we do a budget, a budget allocation every year to hold a in schools program run by Suez, our contractor. Yeah. But schools also are available for funding from Waste Wise Schools, which is a state government program. Um, there's various levels of funding there. Um, the highest tier funding is about $10,000. Um, 
uh, some schools have progressed towards that funding, uh, but we are talking to them and making them aware that it's available as well. Thank you. So can I just clarify, my understanding was that you and your staff are also providing education to the schools, or am I missing the point? Uh, by the contractor Suez. Questions or moving motions? Yes, Councillor Wilson and then, pardon? When you're ready, I was going to move the Okay, just we'll have Councillor Wilson's question first. Um, the Eastern Metropolitan Regional Council has its focus as well. Has any approach been made to the MRC to see if there's any capacity to partner and provide education services rather than through, say, private contractors? Yes, we do also engage with the MRC as well, apologies. Um, I believe EMRC are looking at what they offer to schools at the moment um, with a view to um, provide that across the region, but it's, it's still early. Thank you. So, Councillor, yes, please move. Oh, I sorry. have a question as well. Yes, question. Um, is this $6,720, is that not just for the supplying of the bins and the collection, collection service? Hmm. It's not actually the education. That, that's, that's correct. Yes, yes that's okay. just the. Fees and charges for FOGO to be Okay, so were you also wanting to move the motion, Councillor Hamilton? Yes. Okay, Councillor Quinton has seconded. <laughs> is there anybody against? So that is carried unanimously. Uh, 12 13 is the traffic management request for railway parade. Um, just to also bring Council's attention to the fact that Councillor Hamilton has provided an alternative motion, which hopefully you have. No, it's not on the desk. Oh, it's not on the desk. Do you have a copy to read out to people? Um, hang on. I just realised it was the case. Holmes, did you get a, receive an email with this as well? Nope. No. I sent an email to Peter Mabs. Okay, well, we'll just pull that up, everybody. Are there any questions in the interim? Councillor Wilson? Um, yes, I'm, I'm keen to understand the thought process behind choosing um, speed bumps or speed cushions or however they're described as the preferred method for traffic calming rather than non speed bump based traffic calming methods. So when you say non-speed bump, do you mean things like having central <coughs> narrow points with trees and things? Self-explaining yep. roads. So we had this conversation last week, which I think you may have missed, but maybe Mr Adams can indulge us with the response that he provided last week. Yes, thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, we did do an extensive <coughs> investigation into um, alternative methods of, of traffic control for the area. Um, unfortunately, the the... the the, the Blister Island um, option, which we looked at, which is effectively, I think we had uh, diagrams at the um, at the um, uh, briefing session, but the Blister Island, which allows us to plant trees in the middle, uh, can't be accommodated within the road reserve without um, having to um, uh, extend the road reserve. So it, it just can't be accommodated. Um, we would take out more trees in doing so, we'd also take out more trees than we'd plant. Um, it would also impact upon, um, there's Telstra in the area uh, above ground power, although above ground power will be coming out um, in, the, in the future, but um, it, it can't be accommodated within the road reserve. And if it could be, you'd probably be looking at around in excess of half a million dollars to take an approach like that. So um, the road reserve is restrictive. We did think that the um, speed cushions, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of speed cushions, but um, for $30,000 they do give uh, the required controls in place to reduce speed in the area. Um, I think that sums up what we went through. Yeah, that, that's great. Do you have another question? Uh, yes, thank you. Just a follow up to that question. Uh, Whitfield Street. We inserted many narrow points and slow points in Whitfield Street without having to leave the road reserve. Why would that not be possible on this route? Okay, so I think one of the discussions we had was around the bus route as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Whitfield Street is not a bus route, so the, the Blister Islands, yeah, thanks for that, Madam Mayor. Um, I did, that did come into my mind, but um, didn't come out of my mouth. Apologies. But the, um, yes, it is a, it does that, whatever we do, whatever treatment we do down um, the railway parade, uh, we'll need to accommodate buses. Uh, the, the speed cushions accommodate buses uh, really well. They impact upon cars 
but with buses they um, they allow the, the bus to straddle the cushion so without having large impact upon the uh, um, um, the, uh, the, the um, people on the bus. Um, in regards to Whitfield Street, um, that's also a very expensive option as well. That, that was around, if I remember correctly, above 1.5 million. Um, and that's, that's a, it's a different type of treatment, so that's to encourage um, cyclists, obviously, um, whereas uh, Railway Parade's got a, a, a dual-use path right next to it, so you wouldn't want to encourage cyclists onto the, onto the road. Councillor Hamilton, then back to you, Councillor Wilson. Um, yes. Uh, first of all, um, it's not a terribly long section Railway parade, what you're looking at from I think it's Fifth Avenue down to Lord Street, Lord Street or the, the other way around, whatever. Um, but what I'm getting at is that you had in your plans four uh, of the speed humps, is that correct? That's correct. Right, so um, it occurs to me that you could potentially um, reduce that number and it still significantly reduce the speed of vehicles going down that street simply because the street is not that long and when people are turning the corner from Lord Street they're already going slow it takes them a while to speed up it's really the middle two-thirds section where people speed because when they get the end down the end towards um, First Avenue you've got all the street Middle section. So, so that's like that. Do you need so four? Or we do you need four? And the other thing too is the asphalt speed plateaus. Again, the same question: Would you need four as per the plans? Surely two could be um, appropriate. Um, and so I'm I'm just curious about whether there was any examination of the actual numbers because any reduction in the numbers would also reduce the cost as well. Um, I'm not a great fan of the speed, the, the, the ones that are recommended in option one, but I do think the speed plateaus might be an option. Um, thanks, Councillor. Um, to you, Madam Mayor, the, the reason for the four was is that they fit nicely in between um, Lord Street, Lord Street, Fifth Avenue, Fourth Avenue, Third Avenue, and Second Avenue. Um, so that's that's the reason for those. Um, it does provide. Um, a, a, a decent spacing so uh, that vehicles couldn't um, increase their speed between the, the platforms or the, the cushions. So that was the logical engineering approach. So may I have a follow-up question there? Because your um, speed testing was done at number, from memory, 58 and 38, which are the middle sections, which are where the vehicle speeds. So because, like I said, the other two ends, vehicles are going somewhat slower. So um, would it be worth staff considering the possibility that we only need perhaps two treatments? Um, and that plays into my proposal, so I'll read that out when the Mayor is ready. Um, Councillor Wilson, another question, I believe. Thank you, one follow-up question. Um, <coughs> is it possible under the design to put one of the speed cushions outside the front of the house if the person has an electric cushion? Would that work? Um, to you, Madam Mayor, I think it's very close to where the, the person lives. Excellent. Okay, Councillor Hamilton, would you like to read out your alternative? Um, but Council 1 requests staff to update the traffic management treatment policy and guidelines for, cons for the consideration of Council by December 2021. And 2, that alternative traffic calming solutions be explored, including any potential to reduce the total proposed number of asphalt speed plateaus. So can I just clarify, because at the moment there isn't a proposed a proposal for the asphalt speed plateaus. Uh, there's two, there were two prices quoted unless it's changed from last week. Okay. So and you're specifically not wanting to further investigate the... Um, I've said uh, investigate alternative tra traffic calming solutions, which could be anything that the officer chooses, but I've also asked including any potential to reduce the total proposed number of assets. Okay. So it's really whatever the officer would oh. like to come back with. Are you happy you've got that? Yes, I'm happy. 
Um, do the staff have any comments on the alternative that's been proposed? Any concerns? No? Okay, so Council, Council Wilson? Second. Seconding? Yes. Okay, so anybody against? So that is carried unanimously. Um, 12.14 is the review of the delegations register. Councillor Quinton? I noticed that there is an amendment by the staff around the circus. And I wonder if it would be a problem if we could change that from exotic animals to any animals. Uh, you, Madam Mayor, uh, not particularly. Um, it was suggested in the manner that it was suggested on the basis of our existing council policy relating to circuses. Uh, we certainly do, do you, Madam Mayor? Um, so it was considered appropriate to um, embed that requirement in the delegations as a means of allowing us to revoke our circuses policy. Uh, but in doing so, it would be open to council, of course, to uh, add greater restrictions if they so chose, but um, whether there would be unintended consequences in terms of petting zoos and other animals the council may wish to allow But a petting zoo is not a circus. They don't have to perform under instruction. They just stand there and get hit in the face by small children. Um, so there is a very, very clear difference between a petting zoo. Do we, we have a circus policy then? Absolutely. Can this come back for review? And can we put something into this delegation's register that aligns with that policy? How would that work? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, the intention was to come back to Council to revoke the circuit policy on the basis that requirements were transposed into the delegations, yes. Okay. Okay, Councillor Hamilton? Um, yes. Um, now, I've, for the benefit of other councillors, I um, have had some correspondence from the CEO in respect to um, an amendment that I proposed. and. Um, which you've got in front of you. Um, can I just ask a question about this? Because um, m my, one of my proposals was regarding the sole supplier provision, and I fully understand that the policy, the purchasing policy, would possibly need to be amended to reflect what I'm suggesting. But my understanding is sole supplier provision we've only used once in the last year that I know of. Okay, so it's not something that's utilised regularly. That's correct. So therefore, I can suggest that it wouldn't delay anything greatly. The other thing too is I was putting in a, a position that it should be um, anything under fifty thousand could be um, you could proceed with a sole provider, a precise sole supplier, but anything over fifty thousand should come before council if it was going to be sole supplier. So um, I'm just trying to understand how that might slow down any processes. I'm not sure that it would, um, given the, the small number. <laughs> uh, effectively, um, if we were going to go down the sole supplier route, it's usually in very exceptional circumstances, and there's usually uh, a sort of a unique or service that we're purchasing. Yeah, um, I know, I've read the purchasing policy. Yeah, I do so understand. So it's all not used the, yeah. very often. And I guess the purpose of delegations is to try and um, balance risk with efficiency. Um, and so in the event we were to come back to council, um, there would be obviously a council report that we would need to prepare and then obviously schedule that for the next uh, council meeting rather than doing a um, direct we still have our policies, processes and systems in place, we still have our management oversight and it would still be subject to uh, independent oversight and assurance by um, our audit. So um, yeah, there, there would be some, some delay and there would also be some resource impact. Okay, so 
um, the audit committee, as far as I know, had no oversight over the sole supplier um, uh, episode that I know of. Yep. I don't believe the audit committee had any oversight over that at all. Um, so just I suppose my question is 250,000. Just, just, just so you're aware, the way in which an audit program is developed. Oh, you're talking about the auditors. Yes, yeah. yes so, sorry. So it's, it's usually uh, based on risk. So an audit program is put together each year. Um, and procurement is always, is always a regular feature of any audit program. And so through that audit program, um, the auditors would actually focus on particular purchases so they would have a particular scope of work and so they would generally look at the sort of higher risk type um, purchases and this is where because there's so few sole supplier exemptions um, you know we, whether or not the, I think in the 22-23 program we have a procurement audit scheduled and also the Reg 17 uh, review where the CEO undertakes a review of all its processes so there are those sorts of controls in place. So, so Councillor Hamilton, um, understanding of some concerns about this particular delegation, I had some communication with the CEO this afternoon and given this particular one has linkages to the policy and the regs and so on, I'm wondering if you'd consider deferring this item so that consideration could be given to implications for all of those other aspects mm -hmm. and then it can come back to Council in yes. August? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if there is any other feedback because um, with delegations, they're, they're sort of not the type of um, item that we like to sort of do on the fly at a council mm -hmm. meeting because of the linkages with acts, regs, policies, etc. So we need to just trace it right through. I would be happy to defer it if it comes back in August. Mm -hmm. So with the circus policy. And, and if there is any further feedback from councillors, um, certainly. Well, you you've got my yes. feedback. Oh, thank you. I guess my, my feedback is, is that I, I support what <coughs> Councillor Hamilton is proposing uh, here uh, with relation to uh, the maximum cap of delegation specifically for tenders of goods and services. Okay. All right. So we've got a um, deferral. Yeah, proposal to defer. Is there a seconder for the deferral to coming back in August? Councillor Wilson seconded. Is there anybody against? That's carried unanimously. Um, okay. So now we move to item. Hold on. So notices of motion which we haven't received any. Are there any announcements for the next meeting? No, so there's no urgent business. So that brings us to confidential business. So thank you for joining us. I believe it's your last evening with us.